So thank you so much everyone for coming to our landmark design guideline updates that is focusing on accessory dwelling units. And we appreciate your flexibility in the change of our venue from in-person uh, to Zoom as we did have an issue um, with the, the room that we were gonna be in at the Blair Caldwell Library. So we really appreciate everyone's flexibility. Um, so as this is a uh, virtual meeting, um, we do have some audio tips to start us out with. Um, if you are having audio issues, we recommend applying the background noise suppression and to also test your speakers and adjust the volume. Um, if you would like to speak, you'll simply just hit the microphone icon on your screen. Um, but we will have a presentation that we'll go through first. And then we do have time reserved at the end of this uh, presentation for open group discussion. And then if you're having audio issues still, it might be helpful to switch to your phone and join from your phone. So for this meeting, at the end of the presentation, we will have open discussion. Um, we do ask that you keep your microphone muted until you're called on and um, there is a hand raise function in Zoom. So if you could just use that hand raise function, if you have questions at the ends or comments at the end, that would be really helpful. Um, please be respectful of all opinions and avoid obscene language um, when you're making comments. Uh, this meeting tonight will be interactive and we will be using um, minty.com to get feedback on some um, images and slides that we have. So you'll want to join on Minty at minty.com and enter code 4879-1247. And then if you missed anything in this meeting, it will be um, posted on our website uh, following this meeting. And we will also be hosting a um, in-person meeting on March 20th at 6.30 p.m at um, the studio lofts in the Ellie Calkins Opera House. If you'd also like to join there, um, it will be very similar content. So there won't be any new information there. So to get started, we're gonna open up with a really simple Minty question. And that is basically, did you watch our three part intro series on ADUs? So we use this to advertise and we're just curious how many people were able to watch those and get a sense of what we were gonna talk about today. So again, you'll wanna to go to minty.com and enter the code um, into the Minty app and then just answer that question for us. So we are getting a few responses and it looks like um, several people have uh, watched the videos and several people are planning on watching them later. Um, I would strongly encourage that as they have some good content on uh, tandem houses and some of the zoning code updates. So thank you so much for answering that question. And we'll move on to our next slide. So um, this project is part of our landmark design guideline updates. We're calling this phase two. The design guidelines were initially adopted in 2014 with some updates in 2016. And as um, time has evolved, we have seen that we need to make some changes to our design guidelines. And we kicked that off a few years ago and did make some minor updates that we adopted in 2022. Um, so that was to um, materials and site work and things like that. And in this phase, um, we're gonna be focusing on some bigger topics. So this is the design guideline team. I'm Brittany Bryant, I'm principal planner uh, with the city. Um, I'm joined by my colleagues tonight, Crystal Marquez, a senior city planner, Andrew Abbey, a so, uh, associate city, or sorry, staff planner, Amy Amadon, the design review supervisor, uh, Brady Heath, who's joining us from UC um, College of Architecture and Planning to work on a capstone project. And then some of the other colleagues who are not here tonight are Abby Chrisman, Jesse White, Bridget Torrijo, and Jennifer Capetto. So that's the landmark team that is working on this update project. So here is our phase two update timeline. Um, in this phase, we're focusing on 
Windows and we did do a community meeting on Windows in the fall of 2023 and currently we are making some draft edits and guidelines um, that we hope to present to the community soon. And we're uh, starting tonight with accessory dwelling units. So we're having our first community meeting tonight on that. And again, a second one on March 20th at the Ellie Calkins um, Studio Lofts. Eventually in this phase, we'll also work on um, site work, small accessory structures that aren't ADUs, accessibility, and then finally finish this phase off with signage. So why are we doing this um, is the big question. So currently our design guidelines are very limited on guidance for ADUs. And we wanna create um, specific guidelines that address ADUs and really help our community and customers find that guidance that they're looking at in the design guidelines. We also feel that this is an opportunity for Denver to be a leader in ADU design guidelines. And then thirdly, um, the Denver zoning code was updated recently to allow more flexibility for accessory dwelling units. And we um, need to align some of our guidance with those updates that was made to the Denver zoning code. So um, when we were working on this project, we did look at what historic um, accessory structures existed in Denver. And we do have some um, examples from the late 1880s, uh, 1895 that we wanna show you as we found them pretty interesting. So here you can see various images of accessory structures that are historic in Denver. Um, in the upper left are very simple boxy structures. And then on the right, you have a uh, fairly simple structure, but um, also you see a um, more elaborate roof form with a cupola. So you can see the variety of ADUs that um, historically uh, and they wouldn't have been called ADUs historically, just accessory structures that uh, you saw in Denver. Um, here are some additional images of those um, historic structures that were accessory, accessory to the primary structure. Um, in this image on the upper left, you can see a really lavish carriage house, which ties in with the architectural detailing of the primary structure. The photo on the bottom right corner um, shows a simpler gable roof form and hipped roofs. Um, the, uh, there is a exterior stair on this ADU in the background on the um, bottom image that we found rather interesting as we also um, sometimes see exterior stairs on our new AD ADUs. So the takeaway here is that historically accessory units in Denver were fairly vernacular in nature um, and they were often just storage units and occasionally you did have carriage houses that mimicked the primary residence and were um, a little bit more elaborate in design but that wasn't the norm. So we also looked at Pier City and did Pier City research for this project. And um, here is a map of the some of the cities we looked at. So we did research over 20 cities of similar size across the country to see what they had to say about um, accessory dwelling units. Um, and when we were looking at these peer cities, we were looking at cities that again have similar sizes, similar number of historic districts, and similar um, kind of uh, problems or issues with accessory dwelling units, or perhaps they just develop new guidelines relating to accessory dwelling units. So what did some of these um, cities have to say? So in Hillsboro, North Carolina, you are actually allowed to use modular and prefab structures. However, they can be no taller than the primary structure. <clears throat> in Austin, Texas, um, accessory buildings are limited to 10% of the site. So they do have a very small footprint that they're allowed to do there. And then in Baltimore, Maryland, the materials must match the existing in um, terms of 
uh, texture and color, and it must be compatible with the primary structure. In Mobile, Alabama, they do have guidelines for accessory dwelling units when they're larger than the primary structure, but you do have to break up the massing so it is more um, modular in nature and more, um, it has the appearance of being smaller. And they do have a very specific list of approved and acceptable materials. In Albuquerque, New Mexico, you cannot have um, ADUs in the front or side yards and it needs to complement the historic resource. And then in Sacramento, um, California, uh, you can have um, entrances that face onto the street and really address the street there. So in Nashville, Tennessee, um, ADUs have to be proportional to the primary structure, uh, but they can be little mini knees of the primary building. Um, what was interesting is they don't allow any exterior stairs in Nashville. In Park City, Utah, um, egress is, cannot be visible from the public right away. And then finally, in Boise, Idaho, um, you have to have the same roof form and materials as the primary building. So that's in general, like what we're seeing some of our peer cities say, there's a lot of discussion about compatibility and subordination to the primary structure when talking about accessory dwelling units. So we also looked at um, the accessory dwelling units that have been proposed in Denver's historic districts for the past five years. And as you can see, um, we have gone up in uh, review numbers from 2019. It's almost doubled and we do anticipate this trend to continue particularly as um, the state is considering legislation that would make it easier to build accessory structures throughout the state for municipalities of certain size, and also the additional flexibility that has been included in um, the Denver zoning code in the last year or so. So looking at where those accessory dwelling units are proposed, here is a map of our historic districts and all those blue dots are the um, accessory dwelling units we've seen in the past five years. We do see a fair number of um, ADUs in Curtis Park, Potter Highlands, and the Baker Historic District. And then here is a map of where you are currently allowed to construct ADUs based on the Denver Zoning Code in our historic districts. Um, so you can see any area that is indicated in blue and has a black outline around is a historic district. And some of our historic districts like Alamo Placita and East 7th Avenue, which are districts 31 and 34 respectively, you can only build accessory dwelling units on the west side of the district. And then just looking at the map of where we see um, ADUs proposed, you can see that there are are other districts that we don't often see um, accessory dwelling units in. So um, when we talk about uh, accessory dwelling units, we get a lot of questions about what does it mean to be compatible and subordinate. So we're gonna talk about these two terms a little bit more. So first, when we talk about compatibility, that is a key kind of component and uh, grounding term in historic preservation. However, the Secretary of Interior standards state that there is no formula or prescription for designing compatible, compatible designs. You can use any architectural style and it can be on a spectrum from very traditional to contemporary and it can be a simplified version of the historic structure. But there always needs to be a balance between differentiation and compatibility to help um, retain the historic character per the Secretary of Interior. So here in Denver, we use our guidelines to help define what fits within that term compatible. So that relates to the character defining features of the district, but it can also relate to setbacks, foundations, porches, windows, architectural features and roof forms. 
just like the Secretary of Interior states that there is no um, architectural style that makes a structure compatible, um, we encourage that all new construction express its age rather than a historic style or using a um, historic treatment and creating a false sense of history. Um, and the reason why we do that is we want our historic resources to remain the star of the show. And just like the Secretary of Interior says, you can use any architectural style. Our guidelines say you can use any variety of designs as well. So when we look at the term subordinate, it really is driven by two major concepts, um, and that is the mass and scale, and then the details of that structure. So mass and scale can relate to the height, the width, and depth of a building. And anytime you are building taller or wider or more depth, it has the potential to become the dominant structure on the lot. But you can play with these elements and maybe you have a structure that has greater depth on the lot, but not as much height, and it would still be subordinate to the primary structure. Um, in addition to the just the massing of that structure, how you detail that structure can really affect if it's subordinate to the primary structure. So here in Denver, we have a plethora of architectural styles. Um, it ranges from high style structures to more simpler, simple vernacular structures. So, you know, you might have a bungalow structure that has a lot of craftsman detail. You wouldn't want to construct a craftsman bungalow on, say, a, uh, a, a simple classic cottage because those are just not going to be subordinate to one another. Um, just like you wouldn't want to use a material that is higher quality or more decorative or has um, more craft skill to it. So a lot of times in Denver, we're just dealing with simple hard pressed brick. So a lot of times the best um, accessory dwelling units are constructed out of brick or lap siding that are not more decorative than that primary material. Um, so now that we understand these two components, uh, we have a few mentee questions that we are going to ask you. Um, and most of the um, accessory dwelling units you'll see in the examples are here in Denver. They're not necessarily in historic districts, um, but we're gonna ask you some very focused questions about roof forms and massing and materials. And there's no right or wrong answer to these questions. We want you just to go with your initial gut and react to these. Um, and again, some of them may or may not be in historic districts. So if you hop on the Minty again um, and use uh, code 4879-1247 and answer this first question um, regarding the roof style of this ADU blending in and appearing secondary to the primary structure. And your phone does have some helpful um, considerations for you to keep in mind um, as you look at this question, like, is the roof form similar? Is the roof pitch similar? Is the roof material similar? Do the structures have roof overhangs that are match? Um, what are the heights of the primary roof ridges? So again, no, no wrong or right answer here, but go with your initial gut reaction. And I do see that most people are saying that yes, this roof form is compatible with the surrounding context and this primary structure. So moving on to our next question, um, where historic primary structures are one to one and a half stories, are two-story ADUs appropriate? So we do see this fairly often here in Denver. Um, there are a number of historic one-story structures in the district. And a lot of times people are interested in constructing a um, larger ADU uh, to accompany that smaller one-story structure. So it looks like this question is a little bit more split um, with a lot of people saying that um, they are not appropriate and a lot of people saying that they are. So, you know, you can see the diversity and opinions there. And maybe this 
this question, you know, is impacted by how visible that is. Um, the example we have on the screen is very visible. So that's something to consider as we open this up for um, discussion later in the meeting. So we got a fair number of respondents to that. So I'll move on to our next question. And I'm gonna um, figure out how to clear the screen here for a second. So our next question is, um, are the materials and architectural details of these ADUs related to the primary structure? So we have a few, um, few options there. And if you could just input your, your thoughts, that would be very helpful. So it looks like a lot of people are saying that the materials and architectural details of these three ADUs do relate to the primary structures. And that seems to be the overwhelming response here um, to the, this question. Um, so I'll move on to the next one as we've gotten a fair number of respondents there. So finally, in this um, compatibility uh, section, does this ADU facing a side street fit with the setback pattern and the porch design of the existing structure in the background? So I'll give you a few seconds to answer that one as well. So it looks like a lot of people are saying um, yes, but there's also a fair number of people saying that they're unsure. So this is something that we would love some input on is when you have an ADU and it faces onto a side street, should it have you know, these more decorative features such as a porch and things like that. So um, keep that in mind as we go through uh, this, this presentation. <clears throat> so just one thing to keep in mind, um, the Denver Zoning Code does have regulations that help maintain um, ADUs in terms of subordinate to the primary structure. Here in Denver, all ADUs must be in the rear 35% of the zone lot. So the zone lot is broken up into the front 65 and the rear 35 so you have to place your ADU at the rear of the lot here in Denver. Um, an ADU must be separated from the primary structure by at least 15 feet. And um, with the updates to the zoning code, ADUs can be two stories in height now, uh, but they can be no taller than 24 feet. And then there are some requirements for um, side yard setback and alley setback. Um, but generally speaking, ADUs do need to be oriented towards the alley. So the zoning code does set up that basic for helping keep ADUs subordinate to the primary structure. So moving on, when we're talking about ADUs, um, we always want to know how important is visibility with a new ADU. So, so just some general questions um, to consider as we go through our next couple of Minty slides is, should an ADU be located behind the primary structure? Um, and that can vary as to where an ADU is placed. So the image on the left is showing the ADU totally behind the primary structure. The image in the middle is kind of showing the ADU um, does have a little bit of visibility. Um, it's not totally behind the primary structure, but it's not totally, you know, not concealed behind that structure like the image on the right. So there's always a variety of placements that ADUs can take on the lot. And we do see that pretty often here in Denver, particularly where the south side yards are much larger here to take advantage of that sun. Um, so does it matter if an ADU is on a corner um, and is visible on a side street? And then does it matter if the ADU is one or two stories? 
So um, we have, again, some more examples to show you and more Minty questions to go through um, that we hope will get you thinking about some open discussion here. Um, so we're gonna look at a variety of ADU um, designs and we want you to respond to if you think they're appropriate for historic districts. So our first question here um, is for affordability, or speed of construction, can one-story pre-designed structures be used? Um, so this is a ranking question and you can say no and just hit submit, or you can rank all the options and then hit submit. If you feel like it's okay to use prefab designs, if you wanna rank which designs you see here on your screen that are appropriate from, um, from best to worst, that would be really helpful for us. Again, other uh, cities um, that we researched, they do allow these prefab designs. So we were just wondering if that's something that we wanted to consider looking at here in Denver. And I'll give everybody a second to answer this question as there's a lot to look at here. So we got a fair number of answers um, coming in. No is still pretty popular. Um, so that's something to consider is that maybe not everyone thinks these are appropriate for Denver's historic districts, um, but it looks like options one and two and five are the more popular um, options. And those are simple, small gable structures so, you know, maybe it's, uh, it's about how these, these look versus if, they're, if they can be used or not. So we'll, we'll talk more about that in the open discussion for sure. Okay, we're gonna move on to our next question. Um, and this is another ranking question, um, similar kind of question, um, but for affordability or speed of construction, can a shipping container be used within Denver's historic districts for um, an ADU? So again, you can just hit no and hit submit and don't have to rate the options. But if you do think that a shipping container could be used, it'd be really helpful for us. Again, if you could rate the designs from best to worst. So we do have a variety of different um, shipping container styles here um, with various different cladding materials on it, um, various different heights, etc. cetera. Um, there are a few primary structures in Denver that are shipping containers. Uh, there is most notably one up in West Highlands, but we haven't really seen this proposed um, for any accessory dwelling units here in Denver. So it seems like the overwhelming response here is that no, these should not be allowed um, with the one story shipping container option being the most preferred design choice if, if this is something we do consider here in Denver. <clears throat> so finally, or not finally, um, Again, we get a lot of questions about exterior stairs. Um, so what should be taken into consideration for exterior stairs on ADUs? Um, so this is another ranking question. Um, we have, should exterior stairs be allowed? Um, should exterior stairs not be allowed? And then we also have, um, what should we most consider if an exterior stair is allowed. So if you can take a moment to rank those um, options, we'd greatly appreciate it. And then we just have some different variety of designs here on the screen um, showing you some exterior stairs. Uh, the middle top image does have an exterior stair, but it is, um, 
it is screened with that lap siding um, kind of detailing there. And then the other ones are a little bit more visible. So it looks like a lot of people do think we should allow exterior stairs, but when we are considering those, we should consider the placement of those stairs and the visibility of those stairs. Okay, um, I'm gonna move on to our next question. So for this question, it is um, similar to the last question. What should be taken into consideration for exterior decks and balconies on ADUs? So with the updates to the Denver Zoning Code, you are allowed to have a balcony on the alley. Um, it is limited to 100 square feet and it must be within 15 feet of the alley. So again, same options here as the last question, should we allow them? Should they not be allowed? And then if they are allowed, what should we consider and what is the most um, important considerations to you? So it looks like we're kind of tied between if we should allow them or not. Um, so that's fairly interesting. But a big consideration does seem to be the placement of that um, balcony and deck on that ADU. And then also materials is ranking really highly as well. So I will move on to our next question. Um, so when we were researching some of our ADUs, we found a number of irregular shaped ADUs and we're wondering if these are appropriate for Denver's historic districts. So here you just have some more examples, um, some asymmetrical examples, a small um, structure that is one stories that has rounded corners, um, a kind of star-shaped ADU um, on the bottom. The middle bottom actually has solar panels, so that's why that roof form is shaped the way it is. Um, so we are just uh, curious what you think about irregular shapes. And again, you know, consider does the visibility of these matter? Are atypical windows and doors allowed? Does the size of the structure matter? So here it looks like the overwhelming answer is um, no, um, followed closely by depends on the height and scale of the ADU. So for our last question, uh, we have, is it important to keep the number of materials and roof forms limited when um, designing a ADU? And here you can see um, several examples of ADUs that use lots of materials or ADUs that don't use a lot of materials, um, different variety of roof forms, et cetera. So it looks like um, it is important uh, to keep these um, limited on these smaller um, uh, accessory dwelling units, but it also may depend on the height and scale of the ADU. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to um, actually, sorry, we have one more <laughs> Minty question. So in this um, Minty presentation, we're just wondering if there's anything else you would like to add about ADUs or anything you saw in this presentation or if we missed anything. And this is an open answer. So you can just pop in whatever comes to mind. Um, and we'll use some of these responses to start off our um, discussion that we have planned for this meeting. So I do see, are there lot minimums that would allow for ADUs? And that is um, based on the Denver zoning code. Um, so that does depend 
on the lot size in the Denver Zoning Code. Um, and if it's a 7,000 or less square foot lot, the ADU footprint is limited to 864 square feet. And then if it's more than 7,000, um, I think you can go up to 1,000 square feet, but don't quote me on that. Um, we do have that information available in our intro videos though. So if you haven't yet watched those, I would strongly encourage you to watch those. I see a lot of comments about um, the visibility of the ADU does matter. Um, there needs to be tools to make ADUs more affordable. Um, we need to have some reasonable guidance, um, more flexibility, and neighborhood RNO support should, uh, should weigh more. Size of the lot should be a category. Um, so getting a, a lot of good responses um, and we really appreciate um, those questions. Um, in terms of the process to approve those, uh, currently all accessory dwelling units require review before the Landmark Preservation Commission. They're not something staff can review administratively. And they are something that does require a mandatory three-week RNO review process if there is an active design review RNO. Um, so we, as landmark staff, do refer those accessory dwelling units to um, the registered neighborhood organizations and get their input on those, and then take them to the commission for review. Once the commission approves that, then you can move forward with permitting. So I'm going to open um, this meeting up for general discussion in the last, oh, say, 20 minutes that um, we have. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can all see each other. And if you have any comments um, you would love like to share with us, I'd love to hear those. And I see that Ozzy already has their hand raised. So Ozzy, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Thanks, Brittany. Uh, yeah, I'm so excited. We're finally at this point. Um, I know that my neighborhood Baker has been waiting for this design guideline update eagerly for many years. Um, I, I think the current design guidelines are an active obstacle to quality architecture and design. Uh, they were written at a time before anybody was building ADUs in Denver, and they're basically written for garages. And uh, we, you know, right now we see really beautifully designed ADUs being denied because they are too complex or interesting and really terrible, boxy, boring ADUs being approved under the guidelines. And that's not how anyone wants landmarks to work. Um, I think a really important thing for the new guidelines is to have multiple strategies for how a, an ADU can be subordinate. The current guideline only mentions, mentions simplification, and simplification is re sometimes a great architectural strategy, but often it's just dumb, and it can lead to dumb results. Um, and I think, uh, I think my neighborhood would be really strongly on board. I, I think generally the landmark concept of uh, business in front, party in the back, is is what we're on board with. So maintain the historic streetscape, um, but allow greater and greater freedom in the less visible portions of the lot and in the rear. Um, I think we need a two-tiered set of guidelines where corner lot ADUs and highly visible ADUs are reviewed differently from alley interior lots. And I, I think I would love to see in the future, just as people build more of these, the alleys in the historic districts become a place where things are really creative, really interesting and fun. And you can walk on the street if you want to experience the historic streetscape and you can walk in the alley if you want to be surprised by cool things that you weren't expecting. Okay. Thanks. Thank you so much, Hazi. Uh, TJ, you have your hand raised as well. 
Great, thank you. Um, my question deals with, uh, let's say you have a historic garage on the property um, and it's located closer to the property line than the current setback allows. Can this change of use to an ADU um, be accomplished within, the, within that historic structure? Um, so if you're like keeping the, you're building on top of the existing garage or converting the existing garage to an Yeah, ADU. let's just say converting or building on top. Yeah, exactly. So you would still need to comply with the Denver zoning code setback requirements. Um, if there is a garage on the alley, they currently require a five foot setback. There are some um, administrative adjustments we can do to kind of keep that structure in a similar footprint. Um, but really that administrative adjustment is for does the design, um, does designing with compliance with the zoning code have a negative impact on the historic compatibility? So how that ADU is designed may influence whether or not the commission grants that administrative adjustment or not. So I can't like blanket say we can administratively adjust these. Um, if you're just converting an existing garage, that's probably an easier yes than say if you're building on top of that existing garage. Okay, good to know. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Joel, you're next. Oh, hi, good evening. Um, I, I just wanted to sort of say something that agrees with Ozzy, but it, it's coming from a little different place. Uh, Portland was a real leader and is a real leader in ADUs. And, uh, you know, just, just decades before we were getting back uh, into them in the modern era. And they started off with a high degree of design limitations. Uh, it couldn't be taller than the primary house. The roof pitch had to match the primary house, all of which turned out to be terrible, terrible barriers to building uh, livable spaces and an ADU um, creation. So as we think about this, and I know this is uh, limited to historic districts for the discussion tonight, but um, those kind of examples make me very skeptical about simple rules for compatibility. Um, I'm actually a big fan of the landmark design review process, reflecting on compatibility, taking into account visibility, does it in fact change the historic context or doesn't it? Because it's something you'd only see uh, in the alley or by making an effort. So um, uh, I think less uh, regulation is more here. Thanks. Great, thank you. Danny? Hi, um, thanks for having this discussion and so thoughtfully crafting a presentation. Um, I work with the Denver Housing Authority's ADU pilot program, and we develop affordable ADUs with family members um, across the city at this point. Um, and as we consider, uh, you know, citywide work and looking at potentially working in some historic districts, um, I just want to name some of the challenges that I see in an affordability standpoint. Um, and urge you all to, when you think about a materials list um, or specific design requirements, consider the impact that that has on construction costs, design costs, and uh, programs like ours. Um, so specifically limitations on roof forms and materials, um, specifically, uh, you know, thinking about limitations to where an ADU can fit or how it can sit on the lot. Um, yeah. And to Maureen, you can check your lot size on our zoning map if you want, um, which is my WDRC uh, backslash ADU pilot program. Thanks so much for those comments, uh, Danny. That's really interesting to hear from you. <laughs> um, Use the photo of one of our ADUs. Oh, great. <laughs> um, Andy, you're next. Uh, thank you for hosting the conversation tonight. I guess I have kind of two qualities that are jumping out to me. Uh, one is I think I'd be very nervous about sort of getting very prescriptive about 
roof shape or something like that. I think um, something that's really, really important is taking advantage of solar access. And especially in the historic district context, there are requirements that new tall buildings near a historic district be sort of stepped down in mass or set back to maintain solar access. The folks who are building an ADU on a historic lot know very, very well what their solar access is. And I would just hate to see um, a prescriptive kind of treatment restrict the ability to put solar panels or even just kind of a passive house kind of design. And then the second part too, is that I think, um, you know, we all understand it's important to preserve more than just kind of wealthy ornate, you know, sort of structures as historic structures. And so in kind of more modest parts of town that, that really do deserve kind of um, historic um, designation and, and sort of protection. I, I also am nervous about uh, any rule that would make it impossible to build a structure that is, um, you know, maybe a little taller or similarly sized, a modest historic home in the front. You know, if the community says that that should be a cultural district, a historic cultural district, that's really important. But then we still need the ability for people to to live and want to live in that historic cultural district. So giving um, the ability for people to do more with the sort of back of the lot, which had maybe been unused before. So both of those things jump out to me, but I think this is a well-crafted kind of uh, proposal you guys are working through. So thanks. Great, thank you. Um, I do see in the chat that Declan, Ashley, you are struggling to find the hand raise function. So um, I'm gonna call it on you next since I saw you put that in the chat before some of these other hands went up. <laughs> You should just be able to unmute yourself. All right, I um, I appreciate the comments about the uh, form, but the reality is that the guidelines reference that the ADU is supposed to be compatible with and subordinate to the primary structure and in with reference to the historic context which is further designed or referenced typically as adjacent structures or structures in the block. Um, there is, I haven't found anything in the Secretary of Interior comments that reference ADUs, only reconstruction of um, secondary buildings that have to be completely reconstructed from the ground up. Um, there are at least nine references in the guidelines to compatible and subordinate to the primary structure and the historic context. And that's 5-1 A and B, 5-3 or 4-3, 4-4, 4-5, and A and 4-20. So it is not something that the people who drafted these regulations were thinking lightly about. They referenced it numerous times regarding new construction and the general terms on new construction also apply to the uh, specific ADU for 18, 19, 20, and 21. So I don't think that we can continue to ignore that. The back building should be mimicking the front building. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Jeff, you're next. Hi, Brittany. Thank you. Um, I'm going to chime in and agree with the previous comments with uh, Ozzy and Joel, and think that there should be some more flexibility to add some character and dress up these ADUs a little bit. I think that uh, RNO support, uh, direct neighbor support, should weigh more. I feel like that's not taken into consideration really with the commission. Um, and there's been many times that the commissioners have said that. I feel like we're, uh, we're we're making boring buildings that we're going to regret 20 years down the road. Um, it's interesting. I think that there's a lot of vagueness as well in some of the some of the stuff like visibility. It's sometimes the commissioners will say, "Well, it's not visible," but then I've said, "Well, it's not visible." And they're like, "That's not a guideline." <laughs> so you get so I think visibility is a big thing. Um, if it's in Baker or Curtis Park on a 3,125 square foot lot with two foot gaps or three foot gaps on either side to the house next door and you can't see it. And the neighbors are the only ones that are gonna see it from the side. 
and the homeowners, there should be some, some leeway there. But um, yeah, I think that alleys are going to change over time. If, if, if Denver's goal of reducing car traffic continues to grow, then um, alleys can become more of a, a shared space with the community rather than a place to put your trash cans. Um, we've done it in Curtis park with several alleys that we've beautified and um, there are actually places that get walked with dogs regularly um, and not avoided because they're kind of gross places. And if you add the ADU and, and even more so the entrance to the ADU off the alley, you're activating the alley and you're changing that because now that's somebody's front door. So I could go on and on, but we'll let some other people speak. And if we need some more time wasted at the end, I'll speak again. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Matt. You're next. Okay. Um, I think I'm the only Matt I was on a different screen, but you know, these review of the current zoning language and the guidelines, I need to get back into it. But the amazing part is, is I'm in the lower Highlands area. And depending on the planning personnel you talk to, I'm in a general building form. And I initially was told, even though I have UMX3 mixed use zoning, that basically, unless I had a fire or a flood, I can't do anything with my lot. Yet, I used to have B3 zoning and a garage larger than the primary structure or my two bedroom 1896 house uh, was constructed under B3 on, you know, on the lot uh, perimeter. So I really feel like it took me basically a lot of persistence to be like, what are you talking about? Like I had to look, I'm an engineer and I'm looking at this and I'm trying to understand the form. And I had to call back and speak with first a residential, then a business planner, then back to business, then back to residential and finally figured out, well, geez, I can't have an ADU, but I can have an unlimited number of primary structures. And I may have that incorrectly uh, in the vernacular of the zoning language phrased. Yet, uh, somehow, uh, we reviewed all kinds of other options to utilize the existing garage slash carriage house um, that, that would potentially be in the general form, which the general form means there is no form. And thankfully, I'm not necessarily in a historic district, but I just feel like the effort that I actually had to take and the crestfallen initial conversation should really be less of a uh, possibility for the general uh, public to understand what exactly they can or cannot do. So I also understand that there are a lot of new planners that have been um, brought on board to help with just everything, basically. Um, but it would be really helpful to try to cut through um, some of that, I guess, training and understanding of mixed use or some of these other scenarios. Um, but other than that, I did end up with a senior planner who helped me understand, wow, I may have more possibilities than an ADU, um, but it took me a lot of frustration to get there. So that's just kind of my two cents that would be very helpful to clarify the zoning language, to clarify the overall, I guess, form description, and especially with mixed use zoning, which is inherently supposed to increase density for residential and potentially mixed use as far as business residential uh, within the urban core. So I really appreciate it. Yeah, I know that some of the, there's been some frustration that you can't build ADUs on like duplex properties. And that was what some of the code updates um, were intended to address. And I know that the state did introduce a house bill to make it easier to build ADU or um, to potentially make it easier to build ADUs um, throughout the state for municipalities of a certain size. So hopefully, you know, some of those things do get addressed. Um, but we have quite a few hands raised. So I'll move on to Paul. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm from uh, West Highlands. 
Paul, I'm having a hard time hearing you. Yeah, we can't hear you very well, Paul. All right. Uh, is this better? Yes. Okay. Uh, so any of it, our, our uh, r and uh, reviewing ADUs has become our bread and butter for the last two years or so. Uh, three out of four projects we review are ADUs. Uh, and um, for the most part, uh, they've worked pretty well. They've been appropriate in size, uh, et cetera, and reasonably fit, fit in well. But we're just seeing this um, trend towards larger and larger. Uh, the most recent one was verging on the edge of what's allowable under zoning. And it the, the ADU was actually taller than the primary uh, structure. And it was 80% the size of the primary structure. So I'll throw a few, few things out here. Consider this, um, this may be blasphemy, but think about it. Uh, as you review these, as you think about these, okay, it's okay for an ADU. Would you approve it as an addition to the primary structure? Uh, maybe you would, maybe you wouldn't, but uh, that's always at the back of my mind when I'm reviewing these things. How appropriate is it? Uh, another second big point is uh, affecting the alleys. Uh, again, one of the more recent ones is uh, a story and a half uh, ADU on top of a garage. Uh, in a lot of ways, a very considerate design, but we were concerned about, I'm thinking about the whole block filled with story and a half ADUs on both sides. And it suddenly becomes a uh, something for the Winter Olympics on that alleyway. So, uh, and the previous gentleman also talked about solar access as well. So these are just some aspects that we're talking about and we're thinking about in West Highlands. So thank you for the time. Thank you very much for this uh, seminar. It's great. Great, Paul. thank you, Paul. Kitty, you're next. I just unmuted, sorry. Um, I just wanted to go ahead and stress the fact that I um, feel very strongly that the ADUs contain character defining features of the historic district that they're located in. Um, I, I really applaud the fact that you went through and, and did a review of 20 of the peer cities and were able to um, snatch some pretty uh, pertinent points um, it, it, from my point of view. Uh, again, no taller than the primary structure, limited to 10% of the site. I'm just going to go through a couple of the items that I believe um, are really important. Compatible to the existing structure, uh, list of approved materials. I know that construction materials are incredibly expensive, but I think it's, it, it's very, very important to maintain um, the character of the historic district that the ADU is, is potentially going to um, be constructed. I, uh, I'd like to see uh, complement the existing resource, same roof form and structure of the primary structure. And um, I'd like them to be one to one and a half stories. So they're subordinate to the existing structure. So thank you. Thank you so much, Kitty. Keith, you're next. <clears throat> Great, thanks so much, Brittany, for having this uh, great conversation and having uh, this discussion on the ADUs. Um, I think from a livability standpoint and actually creating the density in which we need um, and help with our immense housing shortage, we really do need to make sure that these structures are livable. And, and by that, it has to be at least a story and a half, if not two stories. Zoning has clearly identified that as a, an issue and they updated the zoning code and I think we need to update the ADU standards for that. Um, we have a lot of single story structures in Curtis Park and given the location that these are typically located within the rear 35%, um, its visibility from the street is very minimal to have a two story when a single story structure is in the front. 
So there does need to be that flexibility. Um, otherwise, we're not going to see any of these built and we're still going to be in an immense housing shortage. So there does, as Joel stated, need to be a lot more flexibility and not overly prescriptive. Um, I think roof forms uh, need to have flexibility because if most of the single story houses in our neighborhood, for the vast majority, we do have some single story Italian eights uh, with flat roofs, but the vast majority of our single stories are pitched roof. And if you did a pitched roof on the ADU, the scale in which that pitched roof would just way over dominate and not be subordinate to the front structure. Whereas the flat roof would allow that two story and not tower over that primary structure. So there needs to be a lot of flexibility in this uh, in order for these to work. And I do encourage you to, to make sure that that flexibility is, is worked out in these guidelines going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Amy, you're next. Brittany, thank you again so much um, for having this tonight. It's very valuable. And I would like to second what Kitty said um, about character defining features. That's the beauty of our Denver historic neighborhoods is they're also different and interesting. And so um, I, I fear some blanket, um, you know, instructions and direction from the city not being applied, you know, correctly per, per neighborhood. So I, I second that. And thank you, Kitty, for bringing that up. Um, the question that I have uh, goes more towards valuation. So Denver's newer in the AD, ADU process than a lot of our peer city na uh, neighborhoods. So I'm just curious, I've done some research on this. When you were looking at peer cities, are there any, is there any data to show how much an ADU increases property value? Um, I don't think we specifically researched that. Um, I can connect back with my colleagues who um, are in the planning and regulatory team that did a lot of the research to see if they saw anything um, with that information, but I don't know that off the top of my head. Okay. Yeah, I would add in, I don't think we really researched that. We typically don't really take cost into consideration. So we wouldn't take how it values the property into consideration either. Um, so okay. FYI. And in general, property values do go up in historic districts and do have some stability to them, just in a general kind of blanket statement. Yes, absolutely. I think it's just important for, you know, to help excite people and get them even more interested in this process, you know, that their their return on investment will be there if they build this you know is that going to show a good return for them on the other side when they go to sell or rent or you know whatever they're going to do with that property so that might be just an interesting um data point as you're looking at this to be able to share with the general public thank you thank you so much and i think our last um comment is from dan hello um, I'm an architect, a realtor, and I live in the 7th Avenue Historic District. And uh, dealing with appraisers as a realtor, um, they would only give you 60% of the value of the cost of the building, the ADU, when they when you go to sell. So no, it does not add value. Um, also, I have, I believe I've been in zoning USUC, which doesn't allow ADUs. I have a one bedroom apartment in my basement, which I could rent out as an Airbnb all day long, but I can't rent it out as long-term rental without applying as, as an ADU. And this is, I'm not even building anything. So that doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, unfortunately that's a, a zoning code issue. Um, I know that they're looking at that, um, but I can't answer for them on that issue, but I, I hear you, how you're not making any changes and you can't use that as a long-term rental. Yeah, I would say we've heard from around like districts and other people are trying to push something like a citywide ADU, but we don't know if or when that's going to happen, but we have heard like rumblings of that. So we so appreciate everyone joining us tonight and participating in the Minty and sharing comments in this meeting. I think this is really valuable 
for us as we consider the new design guidelines uh, for accessory dwelling units. Um, the next steps for this project is we will have a survey that will go live, um, I believe tomorrow. Um, and the survey questions are slightly different than the, um, the questions you were asked tonight in the Minty, but hopefully this presentation will help you consider what some of those Minty questions or those survey questions are and um, help you answer the, those survey questions in a way that you see will help uh, guide the design guidelines. And then we'll begin drafting those design guideline updates. And we will go through a public comment process on the drafts. Um, and then it will need to be officially adopted by the Landmark Preservation Commission. So it may be a little while, but we are continuing to work on this project. And anytime you provide us input, it's so greatly appreciated. And we thank you all so much for joining us tonight. So thank you again. Um, if there's nothing further, um, I am going to end the meeting. Thanks all. And if you have anyone that didn't attend March 20th, let us know. Sign them up. Bye. <laughs> thank Bye. you, Brittany. Thank y'all.